Hey folks, Quill18 here, and it is indeed here, Victoria 3. We've been talking about it, we've been dreaming about it, we've been memeing about it, but Victoria 3 is now just inches away from everyone's hands. At the time this video is going live, I think it's just a couple of days away from a release. There is a link down below in the doobly-doo for where you can get Victoria 3 yourself. This video is very nicely sponsored by Paradox, who were also very kind enough to give me an advanced copy of the game. I, I may have been playing a lot for the last little while. Um, I'm really enjoying the game. And without further ado, we're gonna go ahead and jump right in. And okay, first thing you do get on the screen over here are these objectives. Now, some people have been concerned that you're having to like, you're being limited in your play style in some way from these objectives. These objectives are effectively just an extended part of the tutorial. All that's gonna do is give you some like extra journal entries that kind of are breadcrumbs that lead you in a certain direction. That they don't really do anything. I think there might be an achievement related to, to finishing them. So if you're into achievements, um, you can uh, you can do those, which is gonna be quite cool. But um, yeah, it doesn't change your game, gameplay in any way whatsoever. I'm gonna click on economic dominance here though, just because that is actually the theme I'm gonna be trying to pursue in this particular run. So it's thematically gonna fit us very well. And then we can see what that looks like. I know I'm rushing right now, but I really just want to get to the gameplay, and I'm sure you guys are as well. And I will be playing as Canada, or one of the Canadas, I should say. And here we go on our first game of Victoria 3. We are the Hudson Bay Company way over here. One of the things I've got to say, playing as Canada, it feels to me like in Victoria 3, the various Canadian nations may actually be a great equivalent to Crusader King's newbie island, which was Ireland over here. Ireland is a fantastic place to play in Crusader 2 or 3 um, in, to get to get started because the, the scope of what you're dealing with, it's fairly local and fairly limited. And in a very significant way, that's the situation in Canada. We're going to be spending a lot of time just watching this area over here. We are not really globally influential enough to actually really care about what's going on in the rest of the world. We're also part of an extremely large trade market, the British market over here, which is great because we don't have access to a lot of goods naturally. And we would have, it would actually be impossible for us to import the correct goods, like to import enough goods to keep everyone happy just because of our overseas influence and potential. Uh, the amount of convoys we'll have, ports. In fact, starting here as the Hudson Bay Company, we don't even have any ports at the start, so we can't actually do any convoys or bring any goods in. And we wouldn't really have enough uh, bureaucracy and influence to... Um, well, not not literally influence, but enough bureaucracy to support enough export routes to keep things profitable either. So it's very important that we part, we're part of a larger market. The larger market is also going to contribute to the bulk of our population growth um, because we are hopefully going to make our territory very appealing to immigration and we're going to be pulling people in from the entirety of the British market to dramatically increase our population fairly quickly and not through natural birth rate. In fact, until we even get um, healthcare, we, we might not have much in the way of natural birth rate at all. Uh, all right, currently, it's currently predicted about 1% per year. And this is, I don't believe this counts um, immigration because these are, immigration is a whole other system that kind of, you know, comes and goes and stuff. This is just predicted, I believe, based on um, growth rate trends and things like that. So I think we will grow quite a bit more than 1% per year, thanks to immigration. All right, let's talk about our whole situation. So we are playing as the Hudson Bay Company, and regardless of which of the Canadian nations you start as, um, things are gonna be relatively similar. We have basically nothing going on. If we take a look at our buildings list over here, this is gonna be the buildings, all the buildings are an entire nation, i.e. the Hudson Bay Company in this case, not Canada as wide. We have zero urban buildings built. The only rural buildings we have are five logging camps. We've got one in Alberta, two in Manitoba, one in half of Ontario. We don't have all of Ontario. A bunch of it is in Upper Canada. Uh, in fact, the bulk of the population of Ontario is currently part of Upper Canada over here. And we also own half of Quebec. And again, though, this is a very small, well, I mean, physically it's about the same size, but the bulk of the population in Quebec is down here in Lower Canada. Um, so we don't have a lot of territory and we don't have a lot of buildings. Five logging camps, that is it. Uh, we do have a couple of barracks. They're installed in Manitoba, but we have no um, no ports, no construction sectors, nothing like that currently. And it's kind of the same case everywhere. If you check um, Lower Ontario here, well, sorry, Upper Canada, Ontario, um, by clicking here, they have two sulfur mines, 
one ranch, one tobacco plantation, and one wheat farm, and that is all. Nothing in any of the Canadas, none of the Canadas start with very much at all. Uh, so we, ha we kind of have a blank slate to go ahead and start building our economy. One of the big things with us is we are going to be heavily limited on population here. Uh, we are going to have to carefully manage our building, not I mean, yes, to manage our economy as usual, and yes, we're going to want to make sure we're building profitable buildings, but we are going to have to pay very careful attention to how many workers we have available in each one of our states. So, for example, currently Manitoba is our state capital. If we click on Manitoba itself and look down here, we have 5,000 peasants available. So, let's talk about how the population works in Victoria here. We have, well, first of all, the population is extremely detailed. We can look at the population of our entire nation, uh, broken down in a variety of different ways. We can also also check the detailed list of everything and there's a huge breakdown so this is in my entire nation of the Hudson Bay Company I have 80,000 laborers I can expand this and see that I have 748 laborers that are Anglo-Canadian Protestants that live in Hudson Bay Quebec and work in logging camps not to be confused with the Franco-Canadian Catholic ones in uh, Quebec that work in logging camps. They're, they're obviously totally different, as are the Sioux animists who work in the logging camps in Ontario in this case, and the Métis, and so on and so forth. So you get this big breakdown of pops that are divided, yeah, based on where they live, where they work, what their culture is, and what their religion is. So we get an extremely detailed breakdown of all these things. Now, some of these people are gonna be working, and by default, a lot of them are gonna be working in subsistence farms which um, actually I'm going to switch to the grid view here or sorry to the list view which is super duper awesome I love it so much also I want to acknowledge here I am playing this at 100% GUI um, scaling so that the font is nice and big for all you people who are watching on telephones and things like that but if you are playing on your own highly recommend hitting escape going to settings the GUI scaling here, this is actually recommended to me by one of the uh, the Paradox devs. They say this is how they play on their own. They drop their scaling to like maybe 80% or maybe 90. And then you can fit so much more on the screen. It's actually very helpful for the outliner on the right that can, which is not visible right now, but we'll be turning it on shortly. Um, you can fit so much more information at a glance, which is fantastic. But I think this font's gonna be a little bit too small for the videos. So I'm gonna keep it at the default which I think is this default, just to make sure that when people load the game, they can actually read things. But uh, yeah, for you gamers out there with big old monitors and nice high res, you can bring that scaling down and get a lot more info. Um, so yeah, so the big thing for us is the number of peasants. These are currently working in subsistence farms. This is basically what happens when no one else, when no one has a job, they will just start subsistence farming, i.e. they've got a plot of land somewhere out there and they're just trying to grow a little bit of crops on their own. You don't build these um, at all. Uh, now, these subsistence farms don't make their owners a lot of money. So this is a look at all the subsistence farms in Ontario, well, Hudson Bay, Ontario. Um, and yeah, they don't, they don't use up any resources. Um, they pay themselves, they earn themselves a tiny little bit of a wage, but very, very little. They do produce a variety of goods, which is actually not a bad way to kind of have your economy just at least have a kind of a baseline going on but yeah the people working subsistence farms do not make much money and they may have a hard time affording their needs which actually we should talk about a little bit if i if i look at some pops and we can look at our populations on an individual state so this is ontario specifically here so if we take a look at some peasants in ontario um we can see how they are overall doing um yeah, so overall, the peasants in Ontario are part of the lower strata, so they're not, you know, they don't do a lot of money. Um, their interest group of note are the rural folk interest group, although these are currently politically inactive. Uh, pops with low wealth, low education, don't tend to be very politically active, which has some pros and cons for us. Uh, but yeah, if we look at a specific group over here, we... Uh, I guess, do I have to go to the detail screen? I mean, I can take a look at, the, oh yeah, no, I, there we go. I can keep popping in here. Their current standard of living is impoverished. And if I look at why that is over here, we can see more details. So they pay an average of 13% of their income in taxes, which reduces the money available. Um, and then we can take a look at their pop needs. And in particular, this is all the things they would like to buy and the relative prices. So the amount of money they have is gonna impact how many of these things they can actually purchase to satisfy their needs. Um, now, some of these are, um, 
uh, interchangeable. So they need to eat food, for example, but that can come from a variety of sources. Right now, groceries are very expensive, uh, so they're often going to be forced to buy other things. Uh, so there, there's, there's some options over there for stuff, but... Um, yeah, they're subsistence building, limiting to low standard of living. Uh, their wealth rating over here, uh, this, uh, as they earn money, as they save money, as all their needs are met, you know, that, that sort of thing. Basically, based on how much money they make and how expensive goods are, their wealth category may go up or it may go down. Um, right now, it's we have an unpaused, so there's no progress made either way. But uh, if it goes up and they increase their wealth level, they're very happy and can become loyalists. If they're uh, broke or goods are too expensive, their wealth level may go down. They'll get very cranky. They can become radicals as well. So, you know, we have to we have to manage these things. But for now, the big thing is we just need an economy um, in general in any way whatsoever. Our economy is microscopic. Our uh, gross domestic product here, the GDP of the Hudson Bay Company, is 400,000 per year. And that's about the same for all the Can uh, the Canadas over here. Uh, so if we look at Upper Canada, for example, their GDP is only 300,000. Lower Canada, 420. Uh, it's gonna be quite small for New Brunswick and Nova Scotia, 160, 100. Uh, and the Columbia District over here is at 170. So um, we're, we're kind of part of the big three, Upper, Lower Canada, and the Hudson Bay Company, a little bit the big three. Um, of those three, we have the lowest population at a quarter million. Upper Canada has about 400,000. Although they're going to lose a bunch uh, right away. Their standard living at the start of the game, they actually have a bit of a hard time. They're probably going to bleed off like 50,000 people um, at the start of the game. But um, but it is actually a strong start. I got to say, Upper Canada, you only have a single state to manage. It's actually great as a new player. And it's got my hometown in it. But I want to start with the Hudson Bay Company for other reasons, which we'll get to eventually. Lower Canada over here. Um, yeah, so they have the most. They have a half a million people. Um, but clearly, the individual GDP is a little bit lower because there's not as many things. Individually, our quarter million people here must be making more money because their GDP is equivalent, but we have fewer people. But it's still not much. Let's compare it to the United States of America, which is really only a fraction of its future potential. What's its GDP? Oh, 30 million. So nearly 100 times more economy than us. I mean, they also have nearly 16 million people to my 250,000, right? Quarter million versus 16 million. That's a big difference here. So we are a tiny nation, but it's going to be okay. All right, let's start constructing. Let's start building an economy. We have no construction industry currently. So the only building capacity we have are the five free points that every nation gets at its base. On the plus side, we don't actually pay to support this. Um, so we do start to get this start building for free. However, we are going to want a little bit of a construction um, industry so that we can build a little bit faster. We have a slight budget surplus currently, and we will be able to improve taxes to boost that a little bit more. So the first thing I want to do is I want to build a construction industry. It's not going to make us money, but it'll let us build everything else that much faster. So uh, we're going to build a construction sector. And there's a bunch of different ways that you can be building these, first of all. You can click on an individual state, and then from the buildings view, we've got the construction sect sector visible over there. Um, if you're in the... Uh, grid view, or sorry, yeah, grid view, you get the same button over there. You could start it specifically in Ontario. Again, list view, very handy, just to be able to see more. You can go uh, under trade lands, the first category here, buildings, is where you can build construction sectors as well, which lets you pick which state you're going to build in, which is the exact same view if we go to buildings over here, and under development, if we hit construction sector, again, we get the list of where we might be able to build it. So we're definitely going to want to pay attention to how many available peasants there are in any particular given state, because if this hits zero, we're not going to be able to hire enough people for our buildings. You can also, when the pop up here, you get the note sometimes you'd have not enough qualifications to fully stun, uh, staff this building. Um, buildings will need a variety of different workers. So this building here needs 500 bureaucrats, four thousand laborers and 500 clerks so right away we know we need 5,000 staff to fully operate this so building in alberta would be crazy to start with we're really going to want to limit where we build this to uh, quebec ontario or maybe manitoba um, but even these places that say they have enough people overall you'll still get the complaint about qualifications so some of these jobs don't really need any expertise but some of them do most likely the problem here is bureaucrats and or clerks uh, not having enough if we take a look at Ontario itself, and we look at qualifications over here, we can see, I think it was, was it bureaucrats and clerks? I already forgot what we need to build it. Um, 
bureaucrats and clerks. Yeah, so we need 500 of each. We do have 500 bureaucrats available. Uh, and we do have enough clerks, although some of them might be employed in some of the other buildings. So it's a very likely, and, and for laborers, well, laborers don't need um, any education. They don't need qualification. They just get hired from peasants. I'm betting some of our bureaucrats are currently working at this logging camp or something like that. Or, or something. I don't know. Uh, I don't think we'll actually have a problem meeting the qualifications. And we do get some extra people earning these qualifications um, every month. So we're going to be okay. I think Ontario is a good candidate for our construction building because while, you know, while none of my states, I'm, I'm going to refer to the state, them in states because that's the, um, that's the game mechanic here, but obviously in the long term in Canada, Ontario is a province, not a state, but anyway. Um, Ontario is going to be a fairly high population thing once we absorb Upper Canada. Quebec's going to be in the same situation as well. Once we absorb Lower Canada, and we'll talk about how that happens later on, um, we're going to have lots of population over here. These are going to be great places where a lot of construction is going to happen. Uh, a construction building will give you construction capacity in your entire nation, but um, you do get a slight bonus to efficiency of construction in the actual state where it is as well. So we can expect we're probably gonna be building a lot in Ontario and Quebec, so they're great candidates for construction sectors. So I'm gonna build one immediately so we can build everything else faster. I'm actually, I'm wondering as a Canada thing if it might be worth not building a construction sector right away, uh, just because we're so limited on population. But again, we should be getting more. So we've got that. Let's deal with the other things at the top here before we unpause. I know it's like typical quill, it takes forever to unpause, but we got stuff to talk about. We're getting a little warning about market access. This is fine. Once we unpause, it's probably going to deal with itself. And at 99%, it's okay. Our market access over here determines how good we can sell goods to places. Uh, and right now, I probably just need a recalculation of the shipping lanes uh, once we unpause. But if we're worried, if we check market and go to trade routes, actually, there's not quite enough convoys for the required routes in the British market. We have very little ability to actually contribute a large amount of convoys to this British market. I mean, I think literally we have zero right now because we have no ports, but even when we unify all of Canada, we're not gonna be a huge contributor to this. We're really re um, reliant on mostly Great Britain as well as its other holdings to contribute enough convoys to keep the British market healthy. Uh, this I'm sure is gonna rebalance itself uh, very shortly. However, we will get a crunch here in about 20 years at the earliest maybe 30 years at the latest, there could be a big convoy crunch that we're gonna have to worry about. Um, and mostly it's gonna be reliant on us to probably make sure there's enough lumber in the market. Um, so I'm not worried about that. Battalions and reserves, that just means they don't have a general, which I don't care about uh, right now because we're not worried about warfare yet. Although theoretically tension could rise over here with our colonization, which we'll talk about later. We have no active research. So let's look at that. First of all, the military tree in the middle here I'm really not going to be paying attention to this. We're not uh, likely to get in any very big, significant wars. Um, although I will say, it is entirely possible to fight the United States of America here as Canada, which seems weird. But the reason is we are part, we are dominion of Great Britain here. Well, technically, currently, we are a chartered company. But yes, we are a puppet of Great Britain um, with certain restrictions to certain or, uh, diplomatic things we can do. But we can start, we can, we, can, we can start some noise here with the United States of America. And Great Britain has a very powerful army and they're very likely to join us in those wars. Um, and so we can kind of sit back and relax and let Big Daddy Great Britain uh, do some work. And that might be something we look into a little bit later. Mostly it'll depend on if uh, America beats us to colonizing this place and gives us ugly borders, which is actually fairly likely to happen. Our colonization rate is pretty slow because the um, the primary uh, puller for immigrant for colonization rate is the amount of population we have, well, incorporated population, and we don't have very much at all. So we're sort of sitting at the minimum over here, especially with the fact that it's splitting across three different colonies currently. Um, whereas the United States. Uh, we should be able to see a little indicator for their colonization at some point. They colonize much faster. Also, I think because of that, the tension with their colonization efforts raises so much faster. So they're much more likely to um, have an, uh, an uprising, which leads to a war, which leads them to instantly annexing things. So um, in the current state of the game, we're very likely to kind of lose this over here um, and then get salty about it and then decide to declare war in the United States just, just because, because we're bitter. But... Um, 
well, we'll have to wait until later. Anyway, all that to say, we don't really care too much about military tech, although I will note that the percussion cap does lead to munition plants, which might be something useful for us to build later on. We could become an arms supplier for the world. We'll see. Um, under production, now, right now, we really don't have much of an industry. So this is not anything that's too tempting. If you do start as um, Upper Canada, i.e. sort of Southern Ontario, um, you do start with some some farming and ranching. Intensive agriculture is very appealing early on. Uh, it unlocks intensive grazing ranch, which causes your livestock ranch to consume more grain, but produce more, including more fertilizer, which then gets used for the soil enriching farming, which means you produce more, more, um, more grain from your wheat farms while consuming more fertilizer and it's just like it's a really good little internal loop over here but we don't have any farms currently uh we are going to want some of the um mechanical buildings uh i know th the water tube boiler gets used for lumber yards no it does not we could actually check um in our rural buildings here well, I guess it's until we get the electric sawmill. That's not going to be anything exciting. Here we are. We're going to talk about these different production modes, but we are going to want to produce hardwood. Um, oh, Derek, the steam donkey later on. We'll be able to unlock the steam donkey, which does consume more goods, consumes coal and engines, but frees up tons of laborers. Uh, that's going to be really appealing to us to free up more workers from our industry, as well as the railroad as well. You can see this is another thing that eliminates tons of laborers, uh, as long as we've got some transportation resources available. Those are going to be hugely appealing for the logging camps. Uh, when we do mining, and we will do mining, we're going to want some more of uh, these techs over here. Um, Messmer process is uh, for iron, or for steel making, mostly, but the atmospheric engine is great for our mines, uh, as is the, uh, the boiler over here, as is nitroglycerin, as is dynamite, although we might need some chemical plants uh, to be able to do that. We could consider canneries for a first research under production here. And the reason is currently in the British market, if we go over here and look at all the goods and sort by market price, the most expensive things currently in the British market are groceries. Second to that, hardwood, which we produce from our lumber mills. After that, it's transportation, which we're not gonna be able to produce until we get railroads. Um, then we've actually got fruit, which is fairly expensive, and then opium, which we're not gonna get involved with, and there's some pottery and other things over here as well. Um, glass is fairly pricey and will become pricier, as is paper will become more expensive as well. But early on, our first actual industrial building, I think I wanna build a grocery. Um, Cause right now they're gonna consume um, grain and fish and different things like that, which currently are not too expensive. I don't want to overbuild on groceries early on, but we can't really overbuild on anything. But I think one grocery first might be great, and then we might focus a little bit on logging. Uh, we'll see. But I'm going to go ahead and assume we're going to build a grocer. So if I go into our building thing and go to industry and click on food industry, we can see a list of places where we can build it. Now, this profit prediction is I don't know exactly the logic for this. I think they make certain assumptions about the sale. I think they're pretty accurate about the cost, but I think with the sale prices, um, I think they're making certain assumptions, uh, very conservative assumptions about maybe uh, maybe only selling to the local market as opposed to the actual trading market. I'm, I'm not entirely sure. If we were to build this building in Quebec, it would make tons of money. Um, but... <sighs> You can't just ignore it because sometimes it's accurate. In this case, I'm 100% positive that a grocery would be super profitable in Quebec. Right now, the price difference everywhere here is just based on the fact that these places have different wages. Um, so Saskatchewan, the wages are very depressed currently. So the average wages would be 0.8K per week, as opposed to if we look at Quebec, it's 1.5K per week. So it would be more expensive to build in Quebec, but it would still be profitable. Still, it looks like the great place to build might be something like Saskatchewan. However, I will not build in Saskatchewan. Why is that? Saskatchewan is an unincorporated state. These guys don't pay taxes. So it, it would still be great for their economy and make, you know, people a bunch more money and make them very happy, um, which is great on its own uh, its own count, although they don't really vote because they're not incorporated. Um, but I think I'd much rather build it in Manitoba. Well, I could consider Ontario and Quebec, but to me, thematically, the prairies here, you know, this is where we grow all the food in Canada. So it sort of makes sense to also put the uh, food production building over here. And yeah, people are a little bit... Uh, a little bit rough for money as well. So let's see if we can boost Manitoba. So yeah, I'm going to go urban building here. 
and we'll drop in a food industry, which should make them tons of money. That's going to be fantastic. And with that, we're nearly the end of the episode, but we'll go ahead and unpause. Oh, I didn't actually start research. So I'm going to research canneries to boost um, the food industry, because I think that's going to be quite useful. After that, there's a really good chance we're going to do tons of society research. Um, actually, I immediately un uh, pause again, because there's actually a few other things I want to deal with immediately. I want to pin the interest groups to our outliner. I find that really handy. Um, I also don't mind pinning the states over here, at least for now. And then, yeah, we can see our, our states and our unincorporated territory. Note that it does not include Saskatchewan and Alberta over here, because they, they sort of count, they're under a different subcategory, because there's colonization efforts going there. They're under the colonies view over, uh, over there. But... The big thing is, I kind of want to pay attention to my incorporated states right now and think about continuously queuing buildings up in these things, assuming they've got some spare workers. But what I want to do is I really want to get the intelligentsia happy. And the reason for that is, if, oops, sorry, wrong tab. If they are happy at a plus 10, then they activate propagandists, which gives us a 50% immigration attraction. And this, uh, all these effects are doubled if a group becomes powerful. If they get over 20% clout, all their effects are doubled, which means we get plus 100% migration, which is going to be amazing for us. So I'd really like to make them happy. Um, we can do that by changing some laws. Uh, the other thing I remembered na just now is that we can increase immigration a lot uh, with some edicts, which we're going to want. We need as many people as possible as quickly as possible. We can run some edicts, uh, or decrees rather. Uh, and greener grass campaign gives 50% more immigration as well, which is amazing. Um, well, it's more migration attraction, so not necessarily 50% more numbers, but still moves it in the right direction. Um, we spend authority to do that. So, like, I can run this in Ontario. And then my authority, you know, I don't have quite enough left over. These are not accumulated, like in EU4 or something like that. They're not points that way. This is just, I, I have a certain amount of authority just available to me as just passively just some amount if i'm happen to be on the positive side then as a bonus my law enactment time gets reduced so i can enact laws faster if it goes negative uh for authority it will make opposition interest groups hate me more positive uh, influence le leads to infamy decay which we don't really need negative loses you prestige positive bureaucracy makes your state construction efficiency better so you build things faster um if this goes negative it's really bad because you get tax waste which you don't want we're also spending a bunch of authority currently on a consumption tax for grain which we start with we're going to drop that immediately it cost 500 authority to maintain and it doesn't actually lead to that much money because grain's not worth that much consumption taxes are a great way to make money but the grain one is like really dumb the ratio of amount of money you make to authority is pretty bad plus grain really you know uh, consumption tax on that increases the cost of grain which is really bad for a lot of your pops they uh the poor ones really get hit hard by that whereas taxing things like liquor and luxury clothes um is not as bad in any way whatsoever i probably still do a little consumption tax here we'll revisit this in a bit but i'm gonna save some authority mostly for more of these edicts i'm gonna drop some greener grasses campaigns on quebec and manitoba as well the three incorporated states we're gonna do that um we can also encourage one of the three industry types in each state um which i guess there's not really a bonus to it. We might do manufacturing once Manitoba gets its food processor. We could drop some road maintenance somewhere for bonus infrastructure and state construction, which um, might not be a terrible idea. Like I could drop this, so right now we're doing construction in Ontario. I can do this until the construction is done, then drop it and move it to Manitoba just to help get the initial construction going. That seems like a pretty good idea. Let's spend our influence here. And for this, what I'm gonna wanna do is I'm gonna wanna just uh, make friends with some people. We are going to want to improve relations. Uh, some of you may think, hey, why don't we declare war on the Iron Confederacy or Nitsitapi? Well, the answer is we actually can't because they are, at least in my current build, they are uh, decentralized nations, so I actually can't declare war against them. So uh, the only thing we can do is work to colonize over here. Um, so yeah, so we can't do that, but we're going to want to do diplomatic actions. And the reason is, 
we are going to want to blob up and absorb the rest of Canada. We have a decision that we can make with that. To push that decision, we'll look at it in a second. I need to be good friends with Great Britain. I need to be a plus 50 uh, relationship with them. So we're going to want to improve relations with Great Britain. We also need to be at plus 50 with the nations, the parts of Canada we're going to absorb. So I'm going to start sucking up to Upper Canada and Lower Canada. Both of these, we already have these states incorporated, Ontario and Quebec. They're already incorporated states for us. So when they complete, they'll be part of an incorporated bunch. They've got lots of population, uh, some good resources, and a little bit of industry to get started. So we're going to do that and spend our diplomatic influence. If I go to the journal here, we have a decision for Confederate Canada or Confederate Canada. I don't know if it's like this is the adjective or the verb, but um, if we have nationalism and if we're besties with our neighbor and we have a greater GDP than them, which should be fine, uh, pushing this button will absorb one of the other Canadas. Uh, and then we get the Canadian unifier for two years. It's actually going to be something like, I think it's like 32 months or something we actually get it for or something like that. I think it's just rounding down, you know, paradox math in here. Um, but yeah, we get Canadian Unifier for a couple of years, which gives us a prestige boost, which is nice. Um, but this is also the cooldown for Confederate Canada. So we want to push this as often as possible, which is every two years and change, basically, assuming our relationships are okay. And then we'll absorb the rest of Canada. Um, was there something else? Oh, yes. I'd really like the intelligentsia to like me more. First of all, who's in our government? Just the industrialists. Um, it would be great if there was a law that the intelligentsia and the industrialist both likes. If I tried to pull you in, it would boost legitimacy and wouldn't lead to any radicals. Okay, I'm going to do that. So you'll be in government. You'll like that. And then, yeah, any laws you want to push. These are all the laws that the intelligentsia are, are, are interested in. Public schools would be fantastic. Property women would be great. That's, don't be confused. This is not women are property. This is women get to own property. Because uh, right now they have nothing. Um, and this, what's great about this, first of all, it's the right thing to do. Secondly, it increases our workforce ratio. The more we empower women, the more they're allowed to work and participate in the workforce. We get more workers, which is going to be huge for us. Uh, we actually can't do these yet because we need extra laws to be able to unlock that. Um... Census suffrage uh, is quite interesting. If we have census suffrage or universal suffrage, this leads us down in our journal over here. Oh, we don't have any uh, journal entries, but path to liberalism here. Um, well, path to liberalism is the first step. But uh, I might be thinking of another one. Anyway, these are going to unlock here um, and we can get little rewards from it. Now, there's a lot of support for passing for passing census suffrage. Why is that? Intelligentsia, trade unions, and the industrialists support it. Okay. Uh, and yeah, the, the intelligentsia love it plus, 50, plus 20. Now, that plus 20 is only temporary. While we're trying to enact it, and after it gets enacted, it's going to do that, but it's going to slowly burn off over time. The problem with doing this is it's going to immediately radicalize the landowners. I wonder if that would be enough for them to actually start a rebellion. I'm kind of tempted to hit this. I also would prefer public schools, um, but public schools, the industrialists are not super into. It might still be nice to push this, though, because ultimately this is the one I want. Private schools would be very easy to pass. It's not as good for us, really, although it does increase the intelligentsia political strength, which isn't bad, and the industrialists are in favor of this. The Anglican Church doesn't like it, but they're currently marginalized, so that doesn't matter too much. Oh, I'd really like to do this. Or pass a different tax law, but the intelligentsia don't care about this. They want cultural exclusion, but that's that's actually an improvement over what we've got right now. It's not that much support. Okay, I'm going to go for private schools. This only gets them to plus 10, but at least it won't lead to any rebellion. Okay, I'm going to go private schools. Now, I say only plus 10. If we go ahead and unpause here, it is enough to activate propagandists, which is great for us. And especially, so if we look at Ontario here, their attraction is high because we've got the greener grasses and, and propagandists. But if we can get, yeah, their clout to 20, then they will, uh, that's going to double to plus 100. Anyway, all this is going to contribute a lot to pulling extra people into our nation, which is going to be wonderful. We're getting some radicals uh, going up. And the reason mostly for this is, oh, currently discrimination. All right. So we have um, our, as the HBC, 
Our primary culture is Anglo-Canadian, Anglo um, although they're also related cultures with shared heritage, like Lower Canada here, they're Franco-Canadian as their primary, but both of them are Canadian, so that's gonna be fine. I think English people will also be fine because of the Anglo part, but currently I believe everything else is being discriminated against. Um, our citizenship is racial segregation. So yeah, we have to have a, sh a shared heritage trait, heritage cultural trait, which I believe is what makes it. So even though we're Anglo-Canadian, Franco-Canadians and English people are going to be fine, but I think everything else is getting discriminated against. Um, discriminated pops, I mean, they're obviously cranky. They don't get paid as much. It's it's real bad, obviously, for them. Um, from a gameplay point of view, uh, uh, discriminated pops do get assimilated into our nation. Um, one of the... Um, one of the things, if we did go with public schools, it does increase assimilation. Insert commentary about Canada's checkered past when it comes to schools and assimilation and things like that. We're, actually gonna, we're not going to get into those things. Um, but for a gameplay point of view, we're very happy when people assimilate into our primary culture. Or, and in fact, I think in the long run, it's going to become, um, we're definitely going to be interested, I think, in going all the way up to multiculturalism. Um, because I believe that if uh, a pop type, if a culture isn't discriminated against, I think they're more likely to immigrate to us and we really want to open up as much immigration. Plus, it's the right thing to do. Okay, we're currently running negative money. Why is that? It's because we are currently constructing and constructing is expensive. Um, we had our, our five points that were for free, but now we've built the construction thing. We're actually even gonna change this from wooden buildings to iron frame buildings, which is gonna give us even more construction potential over here. Um, but we are currently losing money. We do have some money banked, but not much. The amount of money you can bank is based on uh, your gross domestic product. It's like one tenth of it, I think. Um, same thing with uh, your maximum debt is about that. So we're, we're gonna be running a deficit right now, but that is looking a little hairy. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna cut our military wages, which won't save us much money, admittedly. I wouldn't mind cutting government wages, but um, if we do that, the intelligentsia disapprove and I really want to keep them at plus 10 or better so that we can get propagandists. Um, we could raise taxes a notch, which I think I'm going to do. I realize it's going to add more um, more radicals, but I think we can deal with it. No, we're losing money now, but the number isn't in red. The reason for that is if I wasn't constructing, we'd actually be in positive money. So this, this is actually a healthy economy, although it's not very positive right now, but it should get better. Um, and there you go. Yeah, we've got the construction sector in Ontario is probably fully employed. It is fully employed. So no matter what, we're always going to be paying these wages. Um, but the huge costs for the construction sector are only happening while we're actively constructing. Still, we're clearly going to want to construct because we want to kickstart our economy. It's going to be really important. The food industry is going to make tons of money and we will be taxing some of that. One of the big things we're definitely going to want to do is we are going to want to switch to a better tax policy. Because currently, what are we running? Um, we're running land-based taxation, which mostly means tax in the peasantry. Uh, it doesn't make a lot of money. It does make our um, our landowners very happy, but the rural folk and the petite bourgeoisie are not a fan of this. Any other tax law is going to generate... Hang on, let me pause a sec. We've got private schools. I'll come back to you. Um, any other tax law is going to generate more money. So you can see we'd make another about 1K uh, from the per capita taxation. We'd make a little bit more if we went proportional. Uh, graduated taxation would also make us more, but not quite as much currently. Although this will improve uh, as our economy tweaks itself a little bit. Um, as we get more rich people because they'll get taxed harder. Now, to unlock gra graduated taxation we would need socialism tech and for proportional taxation we would need egalitarianism which actually isn't very hard for us to reach although currently no one is interested in supporting this uh the bourgeoisie would endorse it greatly but they are marginalized the armed forces and rural folk would also do it but they're not in government so they can't help with that but the per capita taxation would be okay um the trade unions oppose it although i think they'd actually they, they, i think they oppose the land-based taxation more uh they would just rather us jump to a more aggressive one immediately. The industrialists are, are fine with it, and this is one of our major, major groups. They're currently in government, which is why we have 30% chance. I think we are going to push this so that we can make more tax money. So we're going to go and propose that next. No one's going to be marginalized. And in fact, the industrialists, I was going to say, they're probably at plus 10 or above. So capitalists are now contributing more money to the investment pool. Investment pool is a pool of money over here that gets used for construction. It's going to sit at zero right now because we're spending it 
actively on construction. But you can see we're getting 330, uh, actually no, now it just went up to about 600 bucks, uh, I think a month, um, from, uh, from the industrialists liking us so much. So they are going to be offsetting the cost of us building. And if we don't build for a little while, maybe to recover from some debt, the entire time the investment pool is accruing money, so it's gonna improve there. Okay, so uh, this first episode's already gone quite long, so I'm gonna go ahead and put a cut in here. I know we barely advanced the time. I know, but we have done so much already to uh, set up our nation in nice state. Oh, there we go, path to liberalism. If we did run census suffrage or universal suffrage, we would complete this and get an event. I don't remember what the reward to the event is. Um, I think it gives, it might give a boost to one of our leaders or something like that. It's not a bad thing to pursue. And the the, the suffrage laws are, you know, the, again, they're the right thing to do in general. So we might try to move that way. Although currently it would really upset the landowners. If we, um, the landowners uh, in interest group should shrink as we move away from a very agrarian society to more of an urbanized uh, and industrial society. Landowners will eventually become potentially, hopefully, marginalized. And I say hopefully because the landowners are going to be pretty contrary to my interest in terms of what I'd want to develop. The kind of laws that they want to push are not laws I'm, generally speaking, going to be looking to run. So they're going to be very cranky, so we're hoping that they become marginalized so that they're not a problem. Anyway, folks, that's the end of the very first episode, which again, this first episode was pr um, sponsored by Paradox. Thank you very much, Paradox, for sponsoring that and giving me access to the game a little bit early. We are going to wrap it up here. Next time, though, we're going to continue this Let's Play. I'm very excited to be playing as Canada with you guys. Currently as the Hudson Bay Company, but soon Canada. See you next time, folks. Bye-bye.